So kids get recruited at a very early age coming out of our gym. We've had athletes start to get offers in ninth and 10th grade to power five football programs. And a lot of these athletes will go on these visits, they'll go check out all these universities, and then they'll come back with a lot of cool information from the strength coaches, from their football coaches, from wrestling coaches, whoever it might be. And it's really, really interesting to see what these guys have to say and what these men and women have to say regarding strength training. And then what ends up happening is our kids commit, they go somewhere, and I've noticed that they tend to come home and they might be a little bit weaker than when they left. And this started to seem as though it was a consistent issue. We'd have football players, running backs come home, and even after the spring semester, they would be cleaning less, they would be squatting less, their mobility would have a little bit more issues, they'd have different knee problems. And it started to trigger some questions. And, and I started to get other questions from other NCAA strength coaches who wanted to know where they could personally improve and what my thought was from that overarching top-down view. And I'm pretty fortunate where I have access to a lot of the top NCAA strength coaches and I also have access to a lot of other strength coaches who my athletes might be training with or training for. And so it begs the question, what are those big key problems that I tend to see? What are areas where I think a lot of strength coaches could potentially improve? What are areas that I could criticize and see, hey, we could improve this or this school could improve this specific aspect to dramatically increase their entire athletic department's sports performance. And so right off the bat, I'm gonna start with a lot of these coaches love to have training sessions early in the morning. They love to have training sessions at like 5 a.m., 5.30 in the morning. And some of this might be to sort of prevent kids from partying too much. Some of it might be to prevent kids from staying up and just doing stupid things. But at the end of the day, we know that kids in general that are younger, 18, 19, 20, 21, they need a little bit more sleep still. They're still growing to a point. And we know that they will perform better in the afternoon inside the weight room. So that leads us to the next step, which is there's going to be more injuries hypothetically when we're having a very early morning training session. We don't want that. We want a minimal amount of injuries. So I believe it's up to the sport coach. Let's say we're using football, for example, to impact their athletes as positively as they possibly can. We know some of these kids are going to make really bad decisions. We know everybody who's 18 to 24 will make bad decisions. But I believe it's important that they get to bed early and then they have an early morning class and there's an attendance based process around their class. And then after those early morning classes, then they can head over to the weight room. They can get in their training sessions, you know, 9, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning if they want to have an earlier morning training session. But I believe anything before 9 a.m. is too early for college age kids and it can hinder their performance and could hypothetically lead to a higher rate of injuries. That leads us into that next aspect, and that's gonna be exercise selection. And so this is one thing that blows me away. When I have people bring in their, their really cool journals, you know, they're those, those spiral bound journals that are just awesome to look at. I love playing around with them and checking them out. Is that each day, there might be 10 exercises in one workout, 12 exercises in one workout. And oftentimes, it looks as though somebody just threw movements onto a wall and then picked what they wanted to go into that specific day of training. So I found that exercise selection is not always the best. I've even seen programs from power five schools where they've had a deadlift preceding a hang power clean and then a bench press following a hang power clean. So it was a deadlift, a hang power clean, and then a bench press all in the same session. And for me, it's like, what is the goal of that session? Is the goal absolute strength? Is the goal dynamic work? Is the goal upper body work? I have no idea. And I think that that's one of the big questions early on is the exercise selection and the amount of exercises per day is typically 
mind boggling. I don't know what the actual goal is. And I oftentimes see that there's too many exercises. And that leads into that next aspect where the sets are too low. Now think about it. If you've got 10 to 12 exercises in a workout, you can really only do two to three sets per exercise. And I think that that actually has a hindrance on development for a lot of these kids. If we're utilizing a back squat, I'm going to have my athletes do anywhere between six and eight sets so that they can get into a groove. They can feel strong. They can feel the movement pattern effectively. And over time, they can perfect the technique for that back squat, which is going to increase their strength in the back squat. And we know that the back squat has a very high transfer to other exercises. I think that's a really important thing to recognize. The yeah, same with the sets on, say, a technical coordination movement, like a power clean or a power snatch or whatever you might variation you might be utilizing. If you only give the lifter three sets to learn the movement, that's likely not enough for them to really maximize that session of training. They need time to learn the movement during that specific training. They need time to learn the feeling of the weight. And then they need even more time to provide a very heavy stimulus so that they can adapt and get stronger in that movement. So having more sets is also going to optimize that strength gain and it's going to impact exercise selection. It's going to force these NCAA coaches to decrease the tremendous amount of exercises that they have in each given day. Now, this is one that really bothers me when I see it with power five schools is shoes. Okay. So if I see a video of Saquon Barkley power cleaning or full cleaning 405 pounds and he's wearing Metcons, like they're okay. The shoes are okay but they're not weightlifting shoes. He can still catch that forward. He can still get that heel to pop because he's in Metcons. It's not gonna provide enough support. If you're a power five school and you have the funding, I know a lot of schools don't have the funding, especially right now, but if you have the funding, you should be getting these kids weightlifting shoes. Get everybody weightlifting shoes. I was at Penn State in 2002 till 2007 and we got our own weightlifting shoes on the track team. So get them weightlifting shoes. It provides a lot more stability in the heel. It provides more support. It increases their range of motion in their lower back. It improves their dorsiflexion in their ankle. It can help them feel the movement much more effectively than if you're squatting in those squishy shoes. Squishy shoes can lead to injuries, okay? So don't utilize squishy shoes. Try to get these kids weightlifting shoes if you have the budget. And even if you don't have the budget, just recommend to these kids and a lot of their parents will support them. Some won't, but some parents will support them to get weightlifting shoes. That next key that really pisses me off is that we've got a lot of power five schools that don't have women's bars. There's two types of bars. There's men's bars, there's women's bars. Women should not be lifting on men's bars, period. That's it. And that's what one thing that blows me away with Title IX is that should be part of Title IX. Buy every woman a woman's bar on the freaking campus so that they could use the right bar. We have women going off to these power five schools and they're trying to do snatches and cleans holding a men's bar, trying to get a hook grip on a men's bar. It's nearly impossible. So utilize that women's bar. Try Buy a couple women's bars for each specific team, just like you have men's bars for all the men's teams. And that makes it a lot easier for the women to get proper training. If they're on a women's bar, you will immediately see an increase in their strength by five to 10% in that first session. And that can go a really long way in impacting their sports performance. You look like a better coach. Their sport coach looks like a better coach and it's about equality. It's hitting every aspect that you could possibly hit. So get women's bars, stop making excuses. They need women's bars. If they're a female, they should be lifting on women's bars. That next one that drives me insane is a lot of coaches don't let their guys use chalk. You're lifting weights and you're not allowed to use chalk. You have men and women that are putting up serious amounts of weights 
and you don't want them to use chalk. We have people in these buildings paid to clean up. Why not let them use chalk? It's for their safety. Chalk improves safety of movements. It helps them get a better grip. And then in turn, we tell them don't use chalk, use straps. So then we're having them wrap up straps, doing hand cleans and they're catching it and they can't release and they're bouncing their elbows off their quads and breaking their wrist because they're strapped up for a clean. You shouldn't be strapped up for a clean. That's like lesson 101 for Olympic weightlifting. Use chalk, it's for the athlete's safety. If we have a safer situation in the weight room, there's gonna be less injury. It might be dirty, but clean it up. Tell the kids to clean it up. Make the kids clean it up, who cares? On top of that, don't use straps for cleans. Use straps for hangs, for hang snatches. Any snatch is fine. Use it for clean pulls. Use straps for deadlifts if you need. Anything along those lines. Don't strap up for cleans. That next one that drives me nuts. Too many gadgets. You're training 18 to 24 year old kids. These are kids that some of them have never touched a weight in their life. They don't need a tendo unit. They just need to squat. They need to power clean. They need to snatch. They need to front squat. They don't need a tendo unit. So stop buying all these little gadgets that cost thousands and thousands of dollars and get them weightlifting shoes. Get them chalk. Get them women's bars. We've got tendo units in some of these gyms that don't have women's bars. That's pathetic, that's absurd. We have eccentric hooks, we have chains, we have bands. Half these kids haven't even been lifting for a year. Why are you using all these crazy gadgets? They just need to lift. You know, if you wanna get a little fancy, do some partial movements, do some box snatches, box cleans, box squats, whatever. Things along those lines, you don't have to get Crazy. Training an 18 to 24 year old male or female is the easiest gig on the planet because all these kids are ready to blow up from that muscular perspective. You need gadgets when they're 26, 27, 28, and you've utilized every little tool that you can possibly utilize, and they've made all the necessary defense mechanisms to adapt to that different stimuli. So that's one of the big key factors here is that if I use a tool on an athlete when they're 23, that tool might not work when they're 27. And if we're talking about somebody going to the Olympics, that can have a negative impact on them when they're 27. When they're 18 to 24, most of these men and women have only been training for a couple of years. They don't need gadgets yet. They're untrained currently. They can just lift traditional barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, anything along body weight, and they'll still get stronger. So take it easy with the gadgets, try to take that money and put it towards more important aspects of the budget and just recognize that simple partial movements can dramatically help these athletes. And over time, you can start to see you don't need a tendo unit to tell you if this athlete's moving fast or slow. It's more important that that athlete actually has shoes and that female has a women's bar. That number two thing that pisses me off is the lack of a technical model. I hear strength coaches say, hey, you know, they're 18 to 24, they got, I got a big group, I got at least 20 kids here, I can't teach them how to Olympic lift. Really? You can't teach 18 to 24 year old division one athletes how to do a snatch or a clean? How did you get your job? We have people who come into the gym who are seven, eight, nine, 10 years old. We work with 30, 40 kids at a time with two coaches and we can teach kids who will never play division one football, who will never play division one athletics at all. There may be division three kids and they can still learn how to coordinate effectively enough to do a power snatch, a full snatch, a power clean, a full clean, whatever it might be. Find a technical model for each lift, back squat, bench press, front squat, deadlift, power clean, full clean, snatch, power snatch, every lift, there should be a precise way on how to execute it and the athletes should know the exact way that it needs to get done. They should have a technical model. It's the same for when we're talking about a technical sport like wrestling or throwing, you know, even swimming. There's technical models in all these sports, distance running. You have to strive to improve that technique and it's the same thing in the weight room. If we wanna talk about safety, we wanna teach the best technique. And if you are a division one coach and you think that teaching weightlifting is too hard, I don't know why you're coaching division one athletics. Like it's not that hard. It takes time, it takes patience, and you have to prepare for it. 
but you should be capable of doing that 100%. But it comes back to having a technical model, communicating that technical model to your athletes and constantly reinforcing it over time constantly telling your athletes what needs to happen in various positions over and over thousands of times. We've had division one field hockey players come through our gym where they've gone and trained at places where they have video cameras on them all the time when they're doing their Olympic lifts and they can watch what they're doing up on the screen, but the coach doesn't know actually what they want them to do. They can just watch it. Hey, I look nice up on the screen, but they're not saying, do you see what's happening when the bar is at your knee? Do you see what's happening when the bar is in the hip? Do you see what's happening after you make contact? All of these little things are important processes behind being an effective coach. Utilize those cool tools that you have if you do have access to them and understand that develop that technical model so that every single athlete knows exactly what you want in every single position, in every single exercise. Finally, that number one thing that drives me insane is the lack of periodization models that I see with these coaches, okay? So I have athletes that bring home packets and you can clearly see what type of periodization model that they're utilizing. And what's sad is that it's mainly the, the lower levels, the division three, the division two, the one double A schools. Oh, okay, they're using block method. Oh, okay, they're using conjugate. Okay, they're using linear. They're using non-linear. You can really start to see with a lot of the younger, lower level coaches, D3, D2, but they're only lower because that might be where they're starting off. But a lot of these guys at the top power five schools, there's no periodization model. It's just throw crap against the wall every single program. And one program doesn't even lead into the next one. And the next one doesn't lead into the next one. It's just random workouts put together into a packet that's well-designed and looks cool. So that when you open it, you think you should follow it. But then when you start to dig deep into the volume, the sets, the reps, you're sitting there going, what is this? What is the goal of this whole packet? Where are we trying to end up at the end of all this? And that's the one big key factor with that periodization model. You've got to know what is the model I want to use to get from point A to point B, but also how can I communicate that to these college level kids, 18 to 24 years old? Hey, when you're a sophomore, I want you to hit this benchmark. Hey, when you're a junior, I want you at these numbers, these benchmark numbers, and this periodization model is going to get you to that point because of X, Y, and Z. And when you start to explain this stuff to them, yes, they're college age kids. Yes, they're immature. Yes, they make bad decisions. But the more you can educate them, the more you can pull them along, the more they buy into the system, the better they're going to be as athletes. So it's important to take all these different factors into play to try and improve your training system. Get chalk, don't use straps for cleans. Get women's bars, utilize shoes, do all the necessary things that you need to do to have a very good, solid foundation of a system. And ultimately, these two are the most important. Have a technical model for every single exercise and make sure you have a periodization model and educate your sports coach, educate your athletes as well so that everybody knows what those goals are gonna be, what the expectations are, how to get there, and when they can arrive there, they will understand your system much more and ultimately they will make you look better as a coach. If you want more information about periodization, head over to garagestrength.com. You can pick up our parabolic periodization book and course. If you want more information about general training and periodization, you can click on this card right here. Until next time, guys, peace.